combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So bladder cancer is currently one of, those, one of the most widespread cancers, and it is the fifth most common malignancy in the United States, affecting 3.4 million people, with that number rising by 188,000 every year. Bacillus common urine, or BCG vaccine, has been the only agent proven to reduce the reoccurrence and progression in metastatic bladder cancer. However, due to its associated toxicity and recent shortage, Researchers are currently looking for new ways to treat metastatic bladder cancer. So the immune system is activated to produce T cells, which is a type of white blood cells in the presence of non-self or foreign substances. These cells have specific proteins present on its surface called antigens. And when the T cells identify these antigens, it is able to match and therefore attacks. To prevent the T cells from attacking our body's own cells, our body's cells also have unique proteins present on its surface. And so when the T cell attempts to bind to our body cells, it is unable to. And therefore, when there is no match, the T cell avoids. However, since cancer cells are a mutation of our body's own cells, they are able to send cancerous signals to the T cells, inhibiting its function. And you can see here in the picture that the tumor cell antigen, when it binds to the T cell receptor, it turns the T cell off, rendering it unable to attack the tumor cell. So what can we do to stimulate the immune system? Immunotherapy, which is a recently developed type of drug, is able to block this cancer signal. The drug, which is shown as a smaller green dot, binds to the T cell receptor and blocks the cancer, the cancer signal from entering the T cell. In this way, the T cell remains on and able to attack the cancer. So there are two main steps in the treatment. The first step is to apply chemotherapy of gemcitabine plus cisplatin, shortened as GC. By applying the chemotherapy, it kills the tumor cells, and the dying cancer cells then release tumor antigens into the surrounding area. These antigens are then engulfed by immature dendritic cells. And when these antigens are engulfed, the dendritic cells mature and send signals to the immune system, telling it to proliferate T cells. However, even with the increase of T cells, the immune system is still unable to effectively attack the cancer cells, which is why the second step is to apply immunotherapy of ipilimumab, shortened as ipi. So here the drug is able to block the B7 antigen from expressing its cancerous signal, and the drug binds to the CTLA4 T cell receptor, enabling the T cell to be activated. So my hypothesis is that this combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy will show an increase in protein expression, which will correlate to an immune activation. Here's a brief timeline of my treatments. And so here, there are three main blood tests. The first blood test was taken before any treatment was done. The second, after chemotherapy treatment only. And finally, after the last blood test was taken after chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And at each of these blood tests, the Luminex multiplex assay was done in order to find the specific protein concentration for each patient. And so I analyzed the 41 proteins that were done in the Luminex multiplex assay. Here you can see that the highlighted green shows high protein expression, while the red and dark colors show low protein expression. And so for this specific heat map, which shows a visual representation of the protein expression, um, it's a heat map at the baseline. Out of the 41 proteins that I analyzed, I chose four based off of their function. And so the first is TNF-alpha, which is involved in inflammation response. The second is IL-10, which is used as an immunosuppressant and prevents the immune system from overactivating. The, the third is GCSF, which stimulates the production of T cells. And finally, IL-15, which stimulates the proliferation of NK or natural killer cells that are used in the immediate defense of the immune system. So here again is the heat map at baseline. And the four colors represent the four proteins that I focused on. The red represents GCSF, the yellow for IL-10, the light blue for IL-15, and the pink 
or TNF-alpha. Here you can see that there isn't much highlighted green, which shows a low protein expression. However, if you look at the next two heat maps, which show the protein expression after chemotherapy and after immunotherapy and chemotherapy, you can see that with each successive treatment, there's an increase in protein expression. Since it is difficult to see the exact correlation of the protein expression with each treatment, I created cluster graphs in order to show this. And so each dot represents a patient's protein concentration level. And the line in the middle of each cluster represents the average. And you can see with each subsequent treatment, the average increases, showing an increase in protein expression. Since chemotherapy does not rely on the body's response and it is more of an applied treatment, you can see that the data points are more clustered together. However, since immunotherapy does rely on the patient's response, and since every person's immune system is unique, you can see that there is a more spread of the data following the immunotherapy treatment. I also analyzed the p-values for TNF-alpha and IL-10 and the p-value for TNF-alpha was significant, having a value of less than 5%, showing that there was a significant difference and the results were not by chance. However, if you look at IL-10, you can see that the p-value is greater than 5%, showing that the results could be from chance. These are our next two cluster graphs for GCSF and IL-15. And you can see the same trend following here, and you can see the average increasing with each treatment in addition to the increased variation following immunotherapy. The p-values for these two proteins were also significant, having a value of less than 5%. I also analyzed the average overall protein concentration increase from the baseline to after chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And you can see with, all, with my four selected proteins that there was a positive percent increase, especially for GCSF, which had the percent increase of over a thousand, showing protein, showing T cell proliferation. And so, based on my results, I saw that there was an increase in protein concentration following the following each treatment, which shows an immune activation. In addition, you would expect, since chemotherapy does not only kill tumor cells, but actually parts of the immune system, you would expect the protein concentration level to decrease following chemotherapy. However, we actually saw an increase, showing the immune system's ability to recuperate, possibly um, showing evidence for T cell prolifer proliferation following chemotherapy. I also compared the average protein levels following chemotherapy and immunotherapy with those of healthy levels, and I saw that they all fell within range. And so again, my results show that there was an increase in protein concentration relating to an immune activation, and this supports my hypothesis. In addition, we, chemotherapy only treatments did not show a significant increase. Only when immunotherapy was added did we see a spike increase in the protein concentration. And not only did we see an immune activation, but we saw that it actually reached healthy levels of protein concentration. And this shows support for the combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy for future treatments for metastatic bladder cancer. In the future, I would like to investigate the protein biomarker or a specific protein concentration which will correlate to a patient's either success or failure in a treatment. I would, I would also like to explore the impact of, do of the doser schedule on the protein expression and circulation. Here are my references, and I would like to thank Dr. Sung Hee Kim Schultz at Mount Sinai Icon School of Medicine and her group, the Human, Human Immune Monitoring Center, including Manish Patel and Ivy Chin. I would also like to thank my teacher advisor, Mrs. Annette Ferber, and my statistics teacher, Mr. James Locks, at Tenafly High School. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. What limitations, if any, did you run into during your musical? Um, well, that uh, there was a, there were some outliers, and that could have been like the mistake that was done during the test, but because I had like a total of 36 patients, my data was able to um, absorb 
these outliers, and because I didn't want to take it out and make it seem that I tempered the data, so I just kept it in there. Uh, I have a follow-up on the outliers. So in right. figures five, six, and seven, there's clearly what appears to be at least three outliers that are showing that there's in each one of the categories there's right. an elevated point. Yeah. Uh, did you investigate if it's the same individual? Perhaps they just had a higher. Um, yeah. So it, it, I saw that it was actually the same individual that had these outliers. It could have been something wrong when they were taking the test, the blood test, but I'm not exactly sure of why there was an outlier. Oh, so, so it was the same individual? Yeah, it was the same individual. And, and just out of curiosity, did you right. rerun it, just exclude that individual, saying, hi, this person's strange, and what, just the remaining <laughs> uh, 35s? Uh, I, I didn't rerun it because, um, I mean, like, because I didn't personally take the blood test, they didn't really let me touch any blood. Okay. So, um, I just did the protein analysis on that. Yeah. Do you have any idea why these have, for items, these have like... Which one? For one of the protein, we have like a chance result, but for the rest, like... Oh, okay. Do you have any idea why um, it happened? So for, this one for the IL-10, so it's a more of an immunosuppressant. And because my hypothesis was for um, showing an immune activation, the immune suppressant was kind of like just to show a holistic view to see if, like, because logically, if, if there was an increase in immune stimulation, obviously there would have to be an increase in immune suppressants. So um, this actually this showed that there wasn't like a significant difference from the baseline to after chemotherapy and immunotherapy. But if you take a look at my um, my comparisons. It probably didn't have to increase as much because it actually fell within the healthy protein level range already. So I've been asking this question for everyone. What right. motivated this? All right, so um, in 2017, I saw in the news that there was a company that called Merck, and so this produced, and this company produced the BCG vaccine. Let me go back. So this company produced a BCG vaccine, and this was like one of the main companies that produced it, and they were shut down by the FDA because the drug that the vaccine they were, that they were producing was contaminated. And I thought like all these patients that were receiving this help, from, like all this vaccine from this company, all of a sudden can't have it because due to this shortage, so I wanted to find a way in order to treat these patients because they have no other way except for this, and there's a shortage, so why not find a new method? All right, thank you.